thank you. Okay, thank you for coming for coming to my talk, and especially thank Larry for giving me the opportunity. Opportunity. It's a real pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here uh, today. To, today to talk Alice user cooperation using uh, using us from channel coding, from channel coding, source to bridge source coding, network and network coding. Oops. Uh, this is a little bit fancy. Okay, I just go quick. Okay, we know that the communication infrastructure is undergoing a quiet paradigm shift from point to point to the network to communication. Basically, from a single sender, single receiver, to multiple senders, multiple receivers, and possibly and possibly multiple <coughs> relays in the middle. Okay, so what we need instead of the classic Shannon information theory is the so-called network information theory, and we need a distributed signal processing technology and cooperative communication ideas. And <clears throat> this network information theory and multi-terminal communications uh, research area is getting extremely hot. And there were a lot of interesting topics. Um, today, my talk will basically be focusing on distributed source coding and cooperative communication and relay networks. <clears throat> um, and specifically, I'm going to focus on strategies instead of theory and bonds, okay? So it's going to be algorithm strategies. We are, I'm trying to be practical and aiming at short rather than large systems, meaning that a few nodes to collaborate. Uh, the reason is because um, a lot of wireless nodes, okay, uh, distributed in a uh, in the area, it's a little bit difficult for them to collaborate, especially in a decentralized manner. Um, so here are some of the assumptions. Wireless, of course, and single antenna, <coughs> meaning that spatial diversity is hard to get. Half duplex, that's the practical assumption. I also consider time-limited channels, okay, which basically means that sort of slow fading or even block fading. Hence, time diversity is hard to achieve. And because of these reasons, people are talking about spatial diversity. Okay, and we all know about minimum technologies which is great technology for improving the throughput, reduced outage, and increase the dynamic transmit range. Mm, however, for single antenna system, uh, we cannot use this memo. And what people propose is to let users collaborate and construct a so-called virtual memo. So essentially, we're going to build like virtual antenna arrays, okay, to uh, get the spatial diversity from different users. And this is particularly helpful on time-limited channels. And so the system model I consider here, that's the basic system model, which consists a source, a relay, and a destination. Okay, in time, the source and relay can switch roles, so that'll be a symmetric cooperation. <coughs> So in the first time slot, uh, in all the systems, uh, the strategies I talk about, uh, the assumption is always a two-phase cooperation. In the first phase, the source will broadcast okay, to the destination, and of course, a relay here for free. And the second phase, the reader will try to help and uh, you know, relay part or all of the information to the destination. So there are three basic types of relay modes, amplify forward, decode forward, and compress and forward. Um, Okay, in Amplify Forward, the relay basically scales the analog waveform it receives, okay, without doing any digital processing and forward the true destination. In Decode and Forward, the relay will try to demodulate and decode and possibly re-encode it using a different code word and send it to the destination. And Compress Forward is also known as uh, estimate and forward, you know, observe and forward in literature, uh, which Depending on wh who you're talking to, uh, compressing forward can um, take different um, definitions. Okay, in one definition, people are thinking that you know, in compressing forward, the relay will basically observe and compress without actually decode the data. Okay, and send it to destination. But on the other hand, you know, if you really view the decode and forward and amplify, you can actually view decode forward and amplify forward as a special case of compressed forward because whatever you do is basically. Uh, you know, re-representing the message and transmit to destination, okay? And from a particular point of view, we can view this decoding forward as the multi-antenna transmission and compressing forward as the multi-antenna reception. So in terms of practical cooperative schemes, there were couples that have been proposed uh, in the literature. Amplify forward, okay, decode forward, and compress them forward. Basically, most of the exciting schemes 
in literature are decoding forward based. That includes, for example, repetition, code cooperation, space time cooperation, coded space time cooperation, and so on. Uh, but for compression forward based, uh, there's almost nothing. Uh, and in this talk, I hope to propose a practical compressed forward scheme. Uh, and I hope you think it makes sense. Okay. <coughs> Uh, now, this is one thing we observed. A lot of the existing schemes in literature make this assumption that there is a very good quality between the source and the relay. In other words, the prevailing assumption is that when the source broadcast, the relay almost always gets a clean copy of the data. And this is the assumption so that the user cooperation can go on. Okay? However, this assumption may not be entirely true. Uh, we define inter-user outage as the case when the relay fails to deduce a clean copy of the source package, even after you, you, know, you protect the package using channel coding. Okay? And this inter-user outage, the question here is that how often does this happen and how bad when it happens? <coughs> So we did some of the analysis on this, okay. Um, first of all, we found that this inter-user outage is not really that rare, and we cannot safely ignore. Um, for example, we first of all checked the convolutional codes. Again, the, the, uh, the fading type is block really fading because we want a time-limited channel, okay. And we found that it's a 16-state rate one-half convolutional code. Um, inter-user outage, more than 2% even for a signal-to-noise ratio of 25 dB, which is reasonably high. And we tested a, a stronger code, an LDPC code, rate one half, block size 8,000, okay? And this is, again, the curve. You see 18 dB, still 1%, 22 dB, about 0.5%, okay? And this curve, you see not, not much diversity, right, because block fading. So what this says is that inter-use outage is not really that rare. Okay, because anything that in the range of 10 to minus 2 is considered very high in communication scenario. This is LDPC? What? The plot is for LDPC? For LDPC, yes. <clears throat> so now, how bad is it? Okay, here's the thing. We did two parts. One is the analysis, the other is the simulation. Um, for the analysis, uh, we try to compute asymptotic um, error rate, okay? in the case of inter-user outage. Okay, so the error rate is va evaluated over the entire system, but you know, conditioned on inter-user outage. And uh, just to make the representation easier, instead of plotting the real numbers, what I'm plotting is basically the ratio for amplify forward and decode and forward. Okay, and this x-axis is basically the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, what is interesting here is that you can see that you know, this is basically the information rate. Okay, and you see no matter what, it seems that they start to convert. Even if we keep increasing the signal-to-noise ratio, okay, um, the ratio, the error rate between BAF and DF somehow converge to 2.5. So what does this mean? Well, we know that when the inter-user outage happens, the classic decoding forward scheme cannot work. In other words, in that case, decoding forward reduces to no cooperation, <coughs> right? And amplify forward, because the ratio is only one half, meaning that amplify forward in that case, although the relay is able to forward a packet, but because was you know heavily distorted in the first phase and then gets further distorted in the second phase when it reaches the destination it's almost it's so noisy it's close to useless okay so this basically says that amplify forward although the receiver seemingly receiving two copy you know the best thing you can expect is about one half okay about half the error rate of no cooperation okay so that basically says that you know yes mm -hmm. here PDF means no cooperation. DF means no cooperation, yes, because it's, uh, you know, uh, yes, you're right. So, so that is also the same, uh, uh, okay, over here we have actually talked about different cases, right? We simulated AF and two types of DF, um, and these curves having diversity out of true, this is a non outage case. I mean, no inter-user outage, meaning that the relay can always help the source. And this case is where the relay cannot help the source, okay? So basically, the problem sort of boils down to this, okay? If the relay is always, you know, if you can always find a good relay that can always help the source, the problem is solved. It's nice because we have all these decode and forward schemes, which, you know, demonstrate all this excellent performance. But the question is, what if the relay cannot help the source? 
And we are talking about this fading channel. So there is this random fading impact. Okay, there's also shadowing. So there is a small chance where the relay cannot help. And what happens then? Yes? So this here you're saying that mm -hmm. even there, if there's outage, mm -hmm. the probability of uh, amplifying forward is smaller than the probability of error for, the, for no, no forward. Uh, when there is an outage, because my definition of outage is basically the decoder at the relay will fail. But for amplify forward, basically you're not decoding. Yeah. Just the scale, right? The noisy version of this analog waveform. Yeah. So regardless, the amplify forward can always be performed, right? So basically, the, uh, yeah. So you're, you're saying it's good to do amplify forward? No, I'm saying that it's equally bad. I mean, like you are trying this method, right? But the most you can get is about you reducing only half the error rate. But that's not much gain, right? Because decoding forward is like just single diversity. No cooperation because it fails, right? And amplify forward, although the relay is trying to help, and it does help, but it's not very helpful because at most, at the best, you are just uh, cutting the error rate by half. And by half, you know, if you look at here, it's uh, just this gap. <laughs> the classification receives two copies of the signal. What does it do with it? Uh, they do maximum combining. It's the best, uh, like, we are doing the software decoding receiver level uh, at the decoder. So it's basically maximum ratio combining, or you compute the channel log like ratio and add them together. That's equivalent, yeah. <coughs> Oops. So basically, the message here is that what I'm trying to say is that I think in the literature, this impact is ignored. Basically, inter-user outage does happen, OK? And it's not very rare. And when the inter-user outage happens, decode forward performs really bad. And amplify forward performs only slightly better, and it's no good either, OK? So what we try to talk, the first one we try to, um, the remedy we propose is the so-called Slappy and Wolf cooperation. And that is using the idea from Slappy and Wolf coding. Uh, well, we hope it's the first uh, practical compression forward scheme. <coughs> OK, so before I start to talk about the scheme, I have to mention a little bit about this Slappy and Wolf coding technology. And this is also known as distributed source coding, or DSC. Um, what it does is that we have separate sources. OK, the sources do not commun communicate. However, these sources are statistically correlated. and the, the job is basically to compress the sources using separate encoders, separate compressors, no communication between the sources, and send the compressor data to a joint decoder and perform joint decoding. OK, so that's the definition of distributed source coding. Um, this distributed source, uh, distributed source coding technology has close relationship to a sensor network. For example, you know, the sensor observations okay, are usually correlated, and the sensors don't usually talk because they have low power and low computing, uh, yeah, low, uh, yeah, low energy and low computing power. Okay. Um, so now, what is the thing? Okay, yeah, okay let me just get this. <laughs> We know that if we can provide a joint encoder at the source, okay, then this is the simple theory, right? The rate, the combined rate is nothing but the entropy, joint entropy. Okay. Now the thing is that what if the sources do not uh, do not co uh, communicate? So we have two separate encoders. What will be the limit? And the flat wolf theorem basically says that it's possible to perform separate encoding, okay, but still achieve this joint entropy bound. Okay, so here is a graph. You know, if we are performing this joint encoding, what happens is that this is the joint entropy and that's the limit. So basically above this blue line, everything is achievable, the rate. Okay, and now if we are doing slap and roof coding, certain parts of this line still achievable. It's this area. Okay, so basically the combined rate is lower limited, lower bounded by the joint entropy and each of the uh, side rate is basically limited by this uh, conditional entropy. Okay, so in other words, this area. Okay, not every part, but we know that it can be as efficient as joint compression. Okay, and in particular, we have these two corner points. Oops, let me get it. Okay, these two corner points here, this one and this one. Okay, they're usually known in literature as 
a symmetric compression. And the anywhere between them are known as symmetric compression. Okay? So these two corner points, if they are achievable, basically any point along this line can be achieved by, for example, time sharing. Okay? So these two corner points um, can usually be achieved by you know, in theory, okay, compressing one source, so why? Using a conventional entropy compression method, that's a single source compression method, which compress it to the entropy of Y. And compress X, conditioned on Y, you know, the best we can do is basically to this conditional entropy, okay, and then all together they sort of meet this joint entropy bound. <laughs> Now, this is a theory, and this theory was uh, basically developed back in the 70s, and for 30 years, people didn't know how to achieve this bond using any practical coding scheme. And it's only in the last, uh, I think, eight, seven, seven, eight years, okay, people have come up with very nice schemes, okay? And the intriguing part is that although this is distributed compression, the technology actually lies in channel coding, okay? In particular, for this asymmetric compression mass uh, scenario, what we can do is that we can view this Y, okay, so one source Y as a side information, okay, and the other source X as what we're transmitting, okay, and convey it to a channel coding with decoder side information, okay? This is because at the encoder side, we are compressing Y, right, at full rate, and transmit it to the receiver. So Y itself decompressible. The receiver will first of all decompress Y and make it available at the decoder, okay? And then X is compressed at some additional rate, okay? Now what we can view is that we can view it as a channel coding problem because Y and X are correlated. So in other words, we can build this Y which is available at the destination, at the decoder, and some noisy version of X. So that is essentially a channel coding problem. You have a noisy observation of X, you know, to have some additional information, you know, try to recover the original source, which is X, right? <clears throat> uh, so here is the typical thing. We can view Y source Y as a noisy version of X, okay? And we can define a virtual channel that's in the channel coding concept uh, using the correlation between X and Y, and it's essentially like a Binary symmetric channels, this is a crossover probability, okay? And distributed source coding becomes nothing but a channel coding with decoder side information problem, okay? And it has been further proven that, you know, a capacity approaching channel code on this BSE channel, binary symmetric channel with crossover probability of P, y, P of Y given X, such capacity approaching channel code can essentially achieve the limit, Slapian Wolf limit of this distributed source coding. Okay, so in other words, that is also a duality thing. A good channel coding is also a good source coding. Okay, and the bridge to is basically the so-called code binning technology. Okay, a quick brief on the code binning. Uh, I'll talk about the code binning concept as well as the algebraic binning scheme. Let me just quickly do this. Okay. <clears throat> so from the beaming concept, from the theory, we know that it, the joint sources and x, y, okay, can be described by 2 to the power of n, h of x and y sequences, typical sequences, okay, in order to describe this joint source. And for these many typical sequences, we can put them in this table, okay, which has uh, 2 to the power of n, h of x given y beams, and each beam we have 2 to the power of n, h of y sequences. Right, basically put them, and thus we need n times h of x given y bits in order to index a beam, and we need n times h of y bits in order to specify a particular sequence in the beam. And these are the only indexes we need, and combined together, that's the joint entropy. Okay, so that's the theory. Now, in practice, what we do is that we use a so-called algebraic beam, and that's based on channel code. Okay, take an NK linear channel code. So altogether, we have two to the power of N virtual code words. Not all of them are valid code words, okay? But we have this many sequences of length N, and we basically put them in a table, okay? This table is essentially known as the standard array in channel coding, you know? And we have basically putting them into a coset, okay? We have two to the power of N minus K cosets, and each coset we have two to the, minus, uh, two to the power of K sequences. And hence, the syndromes, which is exactly N minus K bits, can be used to index a coset. And the side information Y, okay, 
which is highly correlated with a particular act, can be used to specify a particular sequence in the brain. Okay? <coughs> and of course, with this, um, you know, transmitting X, okay, essentially reduces to, instead of transmitting this lens and sequence, we can just transmit the syndrome or the B index. Okay, because once the B is located, you know, the side information Y can be used to specify exactly what sequence in the bin, okay? And of course, there are some of the assumptions and, uh, okay, of practical rules. For example, we need all this to be maximally separated, all the sequences in one bin to be maximally separated, okay? That is actually guaranteed by a capacitor approaching channel code, okay? <clears throat> so the compression ratio, okay, I forgot to mention, the compression rate is M to M minus K. Basically, M is the length of sequence, and M minus K is the length of index. Okay, so this is the sum of the thing. Uh, now, to explore distributed source coding in user cooperation, okay, uh, before I describe the actual strategy, uh, let me just uh, provide uh, additional statistics, okay? This is basically, you know, here's the thing, okay, we want to use distributed source coding in user cooperation, and remember that distributed source coding sort of wants the sources to be highly correlated, okay? When the correlation is low, you can still do the distributed source coding, uh, but it's, well, in the context of user cooperation, it's less uh, useful, okay? So here is some of the scenarios. Basically, we analyze the case when the inter-user outage happens, okay? So the interior outage happens, the relay does not get a clean copy, right? So there are all these error frames, okay? We check that among all these error frames, for example, in this case, 85% of the error frames contains less than 5% 5 bit, 5 of the error bits, okay? And if you look at this, you know, this is 1 dB, this is 0 dB, okay? And, oh, yeah, this is 13, this is 10, this is 7 dB, sorry, okay? So basically what this figure says is that Although the relay does not get a packet entirely, entirely correct, it gets most of this right most of the time. So in other words, if you look at the inter-user outage, right, um, what this happens is that only a few bits that are in error in this package that destroys everything, spoils the case, okay? So now the question is, okay, you know this relay gets most of this right, should he basically throw the entire package or can he make smart use of the majority of bits which are still correct and bears good information? Can you, can you yes? <laughs> I'm just trying to read mm -hmm. percentage of failed frames. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is basically all the failed frames you've collected, right? And we basically check how many percent contains how many errors. Okay, so basically here we say that 95% of the erroneous frames contains less than 5% of the error bits. Okay, so at at a point. <coughs> so here is my favorite part, the happy marriage of distributed source coding and user cooperation. Okay. So, you know, you see from this diagram that there is a good similarity between the two schemes. In distributed source coding, we have two encoders, two sources, okay, that are highly correlated. We have one receiver, right? In user cooperation we have a source, a relay, and destination. Okay. And in distributed source coding, because the sources are highly correlated, and in the actual performance, right, we are viewing one source as a noisy version of the other. And in user cooperation, when the relay does not get a clean copy of X, it does get a noisy copy of X, right? So there's enough similarity. And okay, so this is the thing, okay? Uh, so basically, I'll just repeat, okay, instead of getting original packet X, now the relay gets packet Y, which is highly correlated with X, and you want to make use of this Y and using the technology from distributed source coding, okay. So for distributed source coding, we already know from the theory that we can do this so-called asymmetric compression, where we let the Y compress at full rate, transmit entropy, and let X you know, transmit uh, some additional amount, which is the conditional entropy. And here, the same thing. We let Y transmit at full rate, okay, and let the original source transmit an additional amount, okay. So this is what it is. The sleeping with cooperation, okay. Uh, this is the case where it's ideal. The source transmit at the first time slot, assuming the relay gets a clean copy, so the relay gets exactly X, 
okay? And then you're free to do anything, decode forward based, okay? Code your cooperation, space time cooperation, everything is fine. However, in the case that the inter-user outage happens, so the relay, instead of getting X, it gets Y. What the relay does is that it will transmit Y, or essentially entropy of Y, okay? And the ledger source transmit an additional amount. Because we are using this just real source code technology, the source and the relay does not have to communicate. Okay, so in other words, the source does not need to know exactly what Y is. All it requires is the statistics. Okay, meaning that how much percentage, you know, X and Y are equal, okay, or how much is it different, or in other words, it's basically the error rate here. Okay. You know, literature, I guess, in corporate decoding is that you don't know the channel. Mm -hmm. So, can you know the statistics if you don't know the channel? You, uh, we don't know the channel. We, I will talk about a mechanism that we try to estimate exactly, basically because this is going to be a virtual channel, right? I will talk about a mechanism that you estimate you know, uh, how much difference. Basically, you know, we are using this real source coding, so the statistical correlation among the two sources needs to be available to source. Uh, why it really does not have to know? Because really, it's just doing a single source thing. It's more the other part that's doing the asymmetric slapping wolf coding has to know it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you know, from the uh, theory of the real source code slapping wolf coding, this completely form a slapping wolf code, and that ensures the derivation of the uh, yeah derivation of both y and x. So that is the second copy of x. Added to the original copy, we get diversity order of two. Okay, and in particular, I should mention that because most of the information, because x and y are highly correlated, right? So most of the information content is actually transmitted through this part. So most of the part is through a different channel, a spatially diverse channel. Only this small additional amount that's the same channel, right? So more or less, you know, you can expect that we still get a diversity order of close to two. <coughs> yes. Why should this be better than amplifier? Why should this be better than Amplify Forward? Okay, uh, I, one thing I can provide is that I can show you the simulation performance like I already analyzed, okay? Amplify Forward, what happens is that um, although the relay is forwarding something, right? But we are talk I'm talking about the inter-user outage case. So by inter-user outage, it means that you know, if you try to demodulate and decode, you are not able to de extract the original right, thing. But, but in Amplify Forward, mm -hmm. I'm not doing any additional processing over what I get at the relay. Mm -hmm. So the relay is pretty much forwarding whatever it got. It's only amplifying it. So it's right. amplifying the noise, but you have noise at the relay here too. At the, uh, at the, at the relay. Uh, this is all just... And you're processing it, and then mm -hmm. you're further sending it. Mm -hmm. What you're doing here more than decoding forward is that you're not dropping the packet if you cannot decode. Right. That, that's, that's right, right, understand. right. In Amplify and Forward, you're mm -hmm. giving everything to the receiver, the final receiver, mm -hmm. and you're telling the receiver you use the best scheme you have, mm -hmm. try to get alpha that you can get mm -hmm. from the two mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why shouldn't Amplify and Forward okay. be better because minimum processing <laughs> and you're, you're, not, you're, not changing, uh -huh. you're not changing the data at any stage, you're sending mm -hmm. To the receiver. Okay, uh, I think I can ask it in two ways. Okay, the first is that uh, you know, amplify forward is really not that simple, right? To amplify an analog signal is really not simple. Okay, and second, amplify forward is not practical because what happens is that you are not going to store this analog signal. You can't, right? So you have this amplifier. You know, here you have the the amplifier data, and here you have the incoming data, right? So if you really look from a system perspective, this is positive feedback, and you are getting a not unstable system. It basically boils up. Okay. But putting this aside, assuming that we do have a working amplifier forward system, okay, here's the difference. I'm saying that if the relay is just transmitting this, no good. The tricky part is that the source is also helping by transmitting this additional amount. This additional amount uses like you know, the novel ideas from distributed source coding. That is the key. Okay, uh, here I'm saying that the relay is getting a noisy version, right? It's actually after decoding, okay? So it's all digital here. It's all digital here. I agree with you, you know, it's probably no good compared to Amplify Forward. Oh, well, no, I shouldn't be saying that, okay? I actually have another scheme. Um, if I have time, I'll cover that. Or that will probably make it even clearer why this will be better, okay? But for now, you know, uh, what I can say is that the source is also helping. So there is a collaboration, further collaboration among that, okay? And this part makes the whole thing useful. Because if there's no this part, what happens is that you are basically propagating the errors. And that's really, really bad. Okay, so this thing, you know, by this three-way transmission, okay, well, three-phase transmission, okay, we can get two copies 
of the original data. Okay. Now, but this is not very nice because the source have to switch back to the transmit mode, which is kind of uh, cumbersome. Okay. Um, but if we observe that what is this? Like I mentioned, this is actually syndrome, right? The syndrome, the being index, okay? The syndrome is essentially a function of x, okay? So you can view the syndrome as some parity bits. Yes? Does the source switch the piece to the information from the relay to transmit the hx given one? Mm. Um, good question, okay? Um, the truth is that you don't have to if like, you know, this protocol is designed beforehand, saying that, uh, for example, if the relay gets only slightly distorted version of x, for example, if the relay estimates that y contains no more than 5% of the error, then the relay will go to the Slapping Wolf Corporation. If the relay gets a really noisy version, okay, in theory, Slapping Wolf Corporation can also be performed, but then it's not worth it because this part is going to be huge and this useful information is going to be very small. Okay, so in other words, the proposed selection of cooperation actually has three modes. The first, when the relay gets a clean copy, so you can go back to any decode and forward based scheme. And second, the relay gets a slightly distorted version, for example, less than 5% of the error in the package, which we can use Slapian Wolf coding. And the third mode is when you get uh, more than 5% of errors in the package, which basically you quit, okay, reduces to the no cooperation mode. Okay, so this is why I propose, uh, provided a slide before, right? I said that most of the time you get most of this right. So the, the slide here, oh, sorry. For example, basically says that you, know, you are making an error, but 85% of the time you're containing less than 5% of errors. So in other words, 85% of uh, the time of those cases, there is possible, is there a possibility to provide this cooperation? Okay, in this case, it's actually 96.5% of time. Does the relay have to feed back Y or something? The relay does not have to. I'll explain why, okay. So actually, let me finish this, okay. I said that, you know, this is three modes and it's not very useful. And by viewing, by acknowledging that syndrome is essentially a function of X, in other words, syndrome is essentially parity bits, we can actually combine the two transmitting modes of source in one, okay. So basically, in the first phase, the source is going to transmit X, which might be channel coded, okay, as well as this additional part. Remember, this is distributed source coding, right? So anything down here and here, they are independent. So the source can safely do this, okay? And relay basically can transmit H of Y, okay? Now the question is that, okay, this will be forming a selection of code with H of Y, right? But that is only useful when the relay is not getting a clean copy. The relay is getting Y instead of X. So what if you transmitted this and the relay actually gets a clean copy of X? Would this additional part be wasteful? And the answer is no. Okay, again, the reason is because this part essentially is syndrome, and syndrome can be viewed as parity bits. So in other words, this part serves a dual purpose. Okay, in the first place, it can serve as some parity protection for X. Okay, and if the relay does not get a clean copy and the relay switch to the sloppy wolf mode, okay, this part can actually serve, um, can be combined with HY and serving as a syndrome for sloppy wolf coding. Okay, and that will get you the second copy. Okay. <clears throat> now, getting back to, do they have to know? Okay. Uh, so if you really think, look at this, the source does not really have to know anything. The source will can always transmit this because this part can always be used to protect X, okay? So it's only the relay that's making the decision whether I should go to decode and forward, slap in with cooperation, or I should quit and go to no cooperation, right? So that requires the relay to sort of have an estimation of how many errors are there in this packet, okay? And we know that there's CRC check, right? That can tell us clean copy or noisy copy. So we need an additional estimation method that tell you how distorted the packet is, okay? And there might be a lot multiple ways of doing it. And what we propose is a very simple mechanism that uses the mean of log likelihood ratio as the metric, okay? So basically, these are a lot of simulations, and that's the mean value, okay? It's actually the mean of absolute value of log likelihood ratio, okay? Because a decode and forward is going to decode, demodulate, right? So it gets all these uh, log likelihood ratios. It takes the absolute value, average, 
okay, and view in this. And if anybody knows channel coding, you know that the absolute value of log likelihood ratio describes the reliability. The larger, the more reliable. The smaller, the less reliable. It's the sign that decides whether it's plus one or minus one, right? So we basically tested this, and we found that, for example, the mean of the absolute value of log likelihood ratio is above, you know, somewhere close to 5.8 or something, then almost always it consists of less than 5% of error, okay? Of course, you can make it to be safer, you know, you can make the threshold to be six or seven, okay? That will basically give you a safeguard, okay? The, the relay, actual relay. Actually, this is irrelevant to whether the receiver or relay, but only the relay needs to estimate. The relay needs to estimate whether you know, it should switch to slap and wolf mode or the non-cooperation mode or the decoding forward mode, right? So this is sort of the relay try to estimate. And so this is what this relay does, okay? The source transmit, the relay try to decode and demodulate, get all the soft reliability information and test the mean value. Okay, if the mean value is above certain threshold, first of all, test the CRC check. If the CRC check passes, good. Okay, doing any decode forward scheme like, you know, encoded cooperation or whatever. Okay, if the CRC does not pass, okay, check the mean, uh, average, the, the mean value of the absolute value of log likelihood ratio. If it's above certain value, above certain threshold, you know that it is reasonably reliable. Okay, you will assume that the package you're receiving is only slightly distorted from the original packet and goes to slap and wolf coding. Otherwise, switch to no coverage. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay, and this is a decoding strategy, okay? At a decoding, of course, you know, this is what we have. The source has two parts, the relay has one part. Uh, of course, we can do sequential decoding, okay, meaning that, you know, combining these two parts you, as a slap and wolf code and try to decode the slit and wolf code and then combine with X, okay? Um, maximum ratio combining can be performed. We can also do iterative decoding, treating them as two parts, right? And somehow feed back the soft reliability information and refine the decision. Or if we can do joint decoding, which is the optimal one, okay? Because if you really think about it, um, I already said this syndrome is essentially some function, a parity of X. And this Y, although it's distorted version, it can also be viewed as a noisy version of X. Now, this is the equivalent channel is essentially BSC, binary symmetric channel, plus a really fading channel. Okay, and the introduced the binary symmetric channel is basically because of the relay decoding decision. Okay, and the really fading part is basically the relay destination fading channel. Okay, so that's a combined channel, and this combined channel can get you the log high ratio, the channel reliability information, okay? And this is just some of the computation. So, so what do you do, mm. like, what is really a really trust? What, what? What is really a really trust? The relay is basically try to decode X, okay, so get the bits, Okay, it's going to transmit whatever it decodes. You can use some additional channel code to protect it or not. Oh, okay. So you're just saying, like, throw away bits that you don't have. Is that what you call compressed? No, no. Uh, <laughs> just transfer those bits, even though they are narrow. Yeah. They are narrow. Even though they are narrow, so you will decode some bits. Then the sum might be narrow. Just transfer those bits. Is that what you Right, mean? right you still transmit them. I mean, like in a channel coding concept, that would be basically a no-no because you are propagating the errors. But if you're viewed from just real source coding, you're just transmitting a distorted, you know, a highly correlated version, right? With the help of source over here, it can actually recover, you know, the other source, right? So you, you really don't do some, some sophisticated compressing program where you, you would do some new coding, new code, which, uh, it's not in the conventional method where you actually compress a bit, okay, to the entropy or something. And uh, this is more like, uh, um, yeah, you can say that because distributed source coding, uh, the, the, this area, okay, it basically relies on the technology of channel coding. All the practical distributed source coding solutions are essentially channel coding solutions. It's more the mapping, the modeling, and somehow converting a channel code a channel encoder and channel decoder to a practical compressor and decompressor. That is the basic the trick. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, this is basically saying that Y, you can basically write this as Y, okay, or some coded version of Y, 
Okay, essentially the information content is the Y, meaning it's a noisy version of X. It's not original X, it actually contains the error, but it's okay. It's still not clear how, how much of battery bits you will uh, append to the, from the source to the... Okay, for this, this much, okay, that can be derived from the rule of distributed source coding because it depends on what is the threshold you're talking about, okay? For example, if I ask the relay to go to slap and wolf coding, if and only if when there are less than 5% of error, okay? So basically, your designing uh, criteria is basically the two sources are correlated with a correlation of 95%, okay? And then using the theory, you can actually compute this amount of rate. The depends on the she, she does it anyway. No, the, the co how, how do you get the correlation is my question. The correlation is such that the correlation is inherent in this scheme because the relay is not getting, for example, the relay derives the packet clean. Okay, that's a 100% of correlation, right? If the relay contains the, has a packet that's less than 5% of errors, that's a correlation of more than 95%, right? But how does, how does the source know how much this, Yeah, this, can, this has to be predefined. Okay, so that's like a protocol level. For example, you are designing for 5% of correlation, assuming that a relay will only forward when there's less than 5% of error. Okay, oh, I, for, I probably didn't emphasize. You're saying you're not wasting that because you're going to use it anyway. Right, right, right. Uh, well, the not wasting part is because even though the relay gets less than 5%, for example, if, even if the relay gets a clean copy, which is X, this is still not wasted. Okay, because I'm saying that this is essentially syndrome. Okay, syndrome is essentially functions. It's syndrome with respect to a projected to estimated uh, channel between the source and the relay. Uh, no, I, I guess that goes to the detail of digital source coding. Maybe I didn't provide that uh, background well, okay. Um, but I'm, I'm basically skipping the part of digital source coding, the, the, the true technology, okay. Um, but here's the thing. I said that, you know, in order to do the digital source coding, we are using a channel code, right? And essentially, I'm trying to perform this asymmetric compression, okay, where Y is transmitted independently while compressed by itself to the full rate, right, transmitted to the destination, and destination decoded, okay, gets Y clean, okay, available at the destination as a side information. Now, the tricky part is how do we compress X to this conditional entropy, okay? And the technology is basically using this NK channel code, okay? So... Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, what is your question? So, so your syndrome that you say is helping anyway the transmission from the source. Yeah, because th this is the thing, okay? The syndrome has to be carefully designed only for one reason. Okay? The syndrome only have to be def defined for one reason, okay? Uh, the reason we want, like, you know, sort of calculate how much amount ha has to be, okay, is because it's po basically because we want to make sure that this forms a valid slip and wolf code that suffices to recover original X. Because if this amount is less than what is required, this is not going to be a, you know, a sufficient slip and wolf code. In other words, what happens is that the relay is essentially uh, propagating errors. Okay, so if you're viewed from the conventional um, scheme where we do only channel coding, right? If there's only channel coding, okay, the relay, if there is only a single bit error in the packet, he's not allowed to transmit, simply because there's no mechanism to identify and recover, okay? Now I'm saying that within the idea of distributed source coding, okay, the distributed source coding says that, you know, um, we can nevertheless recover both. So then I'm designing for a threshold, let's say 5%. Okay, this amount is to make sure that as long as this contains no, less, no more than 5% of error, the, the entire thing becomes a valid slap and wolf coding that suffices to correct all the errors. Yes, that, uh, channel between the relay and the destination is, is, is uh, noisy, right? No, it's noisy. It can be ready fading channel, any other fading channel. Like out of code over, right? Why? Why? to put an out of code over that. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is more like a schematic drawing, okay? All this can be coded, additionally coded. That's a different issue. But the idea is this. The idea is that, you know, viewing the relay, if, you know, <laughs> the relay is getting a noisy version, right? And you know, if you're using the concept of distributed source coding, okay, you know that this can have less be useful, provided the source provided an additional amount. Okay? But in, the, in practice, of course, you can actually you protect Y, 
to make sure that you know y arrives at your destination so that becomes a distributed source coding problem because distributed source coding is a clean channel problem right it's only about compression and not so much about channel coding okay getting confused <laughs> sorry okay and actually what i'm saying here see I said that, you know, equivalently, actually destination, okay, viewed from the receiver, the final destination, okay, what happens is that it's going to provide this joint decoding, okay, viewing this Y also as a function of X. So this is function of X, this is on function of X, and Y, coded or not coded, they're also function of X. This is Y, because this binary symmetric channel is performed, uh, it comes into place because the relay is making error, right? So after hard decoding, after demodulation, the relay already made, let's say, 5% of error. So that's a binary, that's essentially like X passed to a binary symmetric channel with crossover probability of five, right? So this part is actually the Y, okay? And Y then passed through a relay destination fading channel. Okay, this is actually the reception at the destination. See what I mean? So this is at the source. Here, it's actually Y, that's the reception at the relay, and then additional fading, okay, that's the destination rece reception, okay, and the whole thing can be viewed as a cascade of channel from, of BSC and really fading channel, and this is a way to compute log-like ratio. Take the source and relay channel and take a correlation of it and somehow use a distributed source coding, you transform it as side information to the receiver. Right, that's clear, but right. There are uh, still more, two more channels for, for you to do the channel coding. You have to take the channel coding problem. Uh, that's right. That's right. You can, yes. But that's not the essence of this. The, my, my idea is like what you just said, right? You can, of course. You know, in practice, you might also want to protect this or protect that, right? Uh, actually, the, 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 the interesting thing is that uh, we actually did simulation, OK? We didn't do anything complicated, OK? For example, what we did here is that we don't even encode X, okay? We are solely using this part to protect X, okay? Uh, what is Y? I think we didn't even encode Y, okay? And let, let Y to be further distorted, okay? But because essentially that's just like BSC, right? You had some further distortion. Yeah. What? Was the, what? what I don't know. Does, does the re relay listen to H of X? Given the relay does what? Does he listen to the pink part? Yes, he does. Because this is the entire package. This is like systematic bits and party bits. So the relay will use the whole thing to decode. So, so, so he's not really having a BSC channel. Or, or you're the BSC, BSC channel, like after you decode the After you decode and after you make some few errors. No, the BSC channel, this view, okay, is from the destination, okay, and it's only in the case when you have the slap and wolf cooperation, meaning that um, only when the relay actually gets Y instead of X. So this P here is the threshold you set to find Right, that's right. Okay, so this is the slip of cooperation, and here's in a simulation example. Uh, we're using, actually we're using 2000, 1000 LDPC code. Okay, and this is a favorable case where we see 13 dB gain, okay. And this is slap and wolf coding, cooperation, and this is coded cooperation. Actually, we assume that, okay, this is biased, okay, this figure is biased, because uh, the assumption here is that when the relay does not get a clean copy, but it makes less than 5% of the errors. Okay, so in other words, this is a favorable case for slip and wolf cooperation. And whereas for coded cooperation, that's essentially the same as no cooperation because there is error. Okay, and in that favorable case, we know that there's 13 dB gain. Of course, the average system performance has to average over all possible uh, cases. And for that, we get coded cooperation, slip and wolf cooperation, that's more than 4 dB of gain. Okay, and that, that basically, you know, if you really think about it, okay, uh, well, complexity, I didn't uh, go to the detail, but, you know, complexity-wise, there's not really much additional complexity of slap and wolf cooperation for, uh, on top of coded cooperation. And they're using exactly the same code, the same frame. Uh, it's just like here, you have some additional idea for slap and wolf coding, and you know it's possible to do it. 
Uh, it's called code cooperation, meaning code cooperation. So it's actually uh, the two part slapping. Uh, let me think. Oh, I think this is probably turbo. Let me check. Okay, sorry. Uh, LDPC. Now, this is what happens, okay? Uh, in code cooperation, okay, the, first of all, the source will code it using an LDPC code of rate one half. Okay, the decode try to decode, the relay try to decode it. Okay, and once it gets a clean copy, it will re encode it using another LDPC code again of rate one half. Okay, and somehow forward. Okay, so this is a real code cooperation, not just uh, you know, the repetition decode and forward. Okay, it is fair comparison. Okay, we actually also have an extension scheme. This is Slack and Wolf cooperation. We also have Wiener Ziv cooperation. Okay, if you know distributed source coding, uh, Wiener Ziv co coding is an extension of Slack and Wolf coding. So we also have that. It's more generalized, but it's more complicated. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. So the second part of my talk is Adaptive Network Coded Cooperation, or ANC. That uses ideas from channel coding, uh, from network coding. Okay. So unlike the previous system, we are talking only about three nodes, a source, a relay, and destination. What is here is we are talking about a group, a host of senders transmitting to a common destination. And the question is, how do we do user cooperation? Okay, there are two existing schemes in literature. The first is repetition, okay, and I think that's proposed by Lehman, okay. And what's been proposed is a full repetition scheme. Okay, basically everybody repeats for everyone else, and that requires a large bandwidth. Of course, you can be smarter, you know, selective relay, a selective repeat, okay? And the other scheme also proposed by Lehman is the so-called space-time coded cooperation, okay? Both of these two schemes are just uh, simple or straightforward extensions of the existing schemes that's on the three-node basic system, okay? In, user, in the space-time coded cooperation scheme, um, the assumption is that in the first phase, each and every sender takes turns to transmit. Okay, in the second phase, whoever, okay, whoever hears the first sender will collaborate and form a, let's say, M, o, M by one space-time code. Okay, and the assumption is that you always have a valid space-time code and somehow the collaboration can be arranged and synchronization at the bit level can be arranged in order to perform that. Uh, again, that requires stringent inter-user synchronization, which is very challenging in reality. So what we do is that uh, we try to look into natural coding and especially looking into a strategy that's adaptive and distributed in manner. Okay. Um, and this is some of the motivation. Because user cooperation from the physical layer, that's a means of achieving spatial diversity. However, if you view it from the network layer, that's a means of routing. And talking about routing, this network coding becomes immediately relevant. You know, we know that it's generalization of routing. It allows, um, basically, network coding is an extension or generalization of routing. It allows the simple coding capabilities, allows intermediate nodes to perform simple coding functions instead of just to replicate and forward, okay? And there were, um, you know, a lot of work, uh, and the theory has show that network coding is essential in order to achieve end-to-end -end optimality. So in other words, the traditional replicate and forward routing would not achieve the end-to-end -end optimality, and it is only by network coding, allowing the intermediate nodes to perform additional coding function at a packet level that will be, be able to achieve the overall optimality. And further on, okay, so here are some of the network uh, coding research in the literature, okay. What I can say is that most of the work assumes lossless network with static topology. So what the assumption is that we have a network that's like a graph, okay? The link, the edges are the channels, and this channel has only one limit, that's the capacity. Otherwise, it's error-free, it's audit-free, and you know the network beforehand, so centralized control can be, you know, pass one perform, you derive a code on this graph, okay? However, in real wireless networks, we know the channels are unreliable, subject to random fades, and we don't really want a centralized tech, uh, algorithm. We want distributed algorithm, okay? Uh, now, in order to perform user cooperation on multiple users, okay, uh, what we can do, uh, here's a simple example, okay, the straightforward, for example, we have two sources, okay, in order to, for them to get diversity out of two, what we can do is that provide two additional relays, 
and each form a three node system. So the first relay helping the first source, the second relay helping the second source, and basically replicating the three node system. That's a very straightforward way. Now, a smarter strategy is to use a single relay simultaneously helping the two sources. Instead of forwarding A and B, it forwards A plus B. This plus is basically binary addition at the you know, bit, uh, you know, packet level, okay, or basically bit by bit in the original sequence, okay. So here, A or B is known in network literature, network coding literature as symbol, or essentially it's a vector or a packet, okay. So, you know, if we do some of the analysis, we can easily find that this is going to be a lot better, okay, bandwidth more efficient and a lower outage rate. And from the coding perspective, the gain is essentially from the fact that parity code, the single parity check code, A, B, A plus B, is a more powerful code than the repetition code, A, B, A, B. Okay, so now if you, we are equipped with this idea, it becomes kind of obvious that any code, especially systematic code, okay, can be directly applied to this user cooperation. Okay, um, so here's an example. For example, I have four users two sources transmit into a common destination, so each source can broadcast. And what happens is that I can ask the three relays to help them, okay? And that can form a 7-4 systematic having code, okay? And if you have more users, more sophisticated, code, sophisticated codes can be applied, no-brainer. Now, the only question is that, okay, uh, this is just repeating what I'm saying, okay? The only question here, or the only problem is here, that channel has random fates. For example, in this case, the two sources are transmitting A and B. The relay is supposed to relay A plus B. But what if certain links breaks and the relay does not even get the certain symbols that it is required, it needs to, in order to perform the coding function? Okay, so that is sort of the challenge. So in other words, because we are talking about wireless networks, channels are randomly faded, the network topology can be changing all the time, and you know, any fixed coding scheme is not efficient or sometimes not even applicable. And what we need is an adaptive scheme, and we want this adaptation to be arranged in a distributed manner. Okay, so this comes to our idea, adaptive network coded cooperation. The key idea is basically matching code on graph with network on graph. By code on graph, I mean LDBC or LDBC codes, and network on graph, I mean instantaneous network topology represented in graph. Okay, so here is a simple example. Assuming I have five users, A, B, C, E, F, transmitting to a common destination. The destination is not shown, okay? So for in the first phase, each user broadcasts its data, okay? And of course, the rest of the users here for free. But because the channels are wireless, you know, random phase or errors or outage or whatever, you know, not everybody overhears everybody else. So assuming for the time being that this graph, uh, this graph represents the topology of the connectivity, okay? In other words, I mean, like a direct link represents a successful reception. For example, user A hears B, C, E, F, okay? Whereas user B only hears A and C, okay, for that particular transmission. Now, what happens is that this network graph or the network topology at this instantaneous time can be translated to this bipartite graph, which corresponds to an LDPC code, okay? And the transmission is rather straightforward. For example, this A, here's from five users, four users, right? So basically, here's a check node A, okay? That's basically combining all these packets, getting to a parity symbol, okay? So over here, the black circles represent the original transmissions in the first phase, the systematic packets, okay? And here are basically the relay packets or the parity packets. And each packet is nothing but a checksum of whatever you receive, okay? And that naturally becomes a 10.5 LDP, LDPC code, okay? Additionally... So, so, so the, the assumption is that whatever, whenever you hear more than one packet, you do some linear combination. Yes, you can, yes. Is that what you do, or you can, you can capture more than one packet at the same time? 
no, uh, the, what, what you said before was what I was doing. Okay, basically, no matter what you receive, okay, you're combining them, performing a checksum, so compute a padded bits, padded symbol, okay, on top of this. Can you just, do you remember all the packets, or do you remember just the linear combination? Uh, you don't have to remember all the packets. Basically, this is, you know, when you, after you decode, okay, you have to store all of them. Well, or you store a few of them, okay? Uh, let me finish this before I answer your question, okay? So I said that, you know, in this, uh, in this graph, right, this, this, uh, this user, this relay, you know, try to compute a single party check, okay, or party symbol, okay, on whatever it's received. But in reality, you don't have to do it because depending on what is the reception, the graph might get very dense. So instead of computing a party on all the packets you receive, you can selective, you can randomly select only a few of them and combine them, do the this linear combination. Okay, that's essentially what we call thinning the graph. Okay, for example, in this case, you know, um, node A can deselect what it hears from E and only performs party check on the rest of three packets it received. And similarly, um, this user E can deselect a packet from C and perform a parity check, okay? And if you look, you know, this, uh, this graph happen to be free of length four cycles, okay? And the reason is because we want to use iterative decoding, the message passing decoding, whose performance is related to the cycles. The fewer the cycles, you know, the better the performance. Okay, so getting back to what you answer, okay? You know, in the first place, each user transmits, okay? Uh, and each user also at the same time try to overhear and decode. Okay, and it will store a few of them. It decodes and stores a few of them and perform this random, uh, just randomly, okay, and store a few of them and perform a checksum and forward it to the destination at the second phase. Also, destination is somewhere. Yeah, I already mentioned destination is not shown in this graph. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we know. This scheme essentially explores the ensemble of random LDPC code, each time with a different code graph, okay, a different code, instantaneous code is generated on the fly and the, the algorithm is very distributed because essentially each sender, each, each node here, each relay here is forming only a check. So the encoder part is basically done by all the nodes, each one performing one check and the decoder is done by the decoder that's a uh, that's on the entire code graph. Okay, clearly the code batches perfectly to the network topology in real time. Okay, and however, because it's instantaneous, it's on the fly, a bit map has to be piggybacked on the, each package so that the destination knows, you know, how each check is formed on what packets. Okay, and this also requires an adaptive decoding architecture at the destination, which can be implemented, for example, by soft radio. Okay, because we are actually talking about an ensemble of random codes. Each time a different code is instantationalized. Okay. And of course we can do further improvement. For example, we can introduce a user diversity to it. Not everybody has to relay. You know, the good ones, okay, or the ones that have a lot of power can do it. And you can do more than once if you want. Of course, each time you form a different check. Okay, random selection and random forming a check. And of course, resource man management like you know, the power allocation you know, can be introduced on top to, the, to top of that, okay? So we did some simulations considering a thousand transmitting terminals uh, and we assuming inter-user connectivity to, to be only 10%. So basically means that the source destination channel, uh, the, the inter-user channels are pretty bad, okay? And the rest is basically a block fading channel, okay? And I have to mention two slightly different schemes. One is using the LDGM codes, low density generated ma matrix ensemble, okay? Low density generated matrix codes. And this is a code, okay? It's a, actually essentially an LDPC code. You have a random sparse part and you have an identity pi on the left, on the right, okay? So this part corresponds to the systematic symbols the first phase, and this part corresponds to the parity symbols, the second phase, okay? And this can be applied to any, um, you know, the, the only assumption here, the only requirement here is basically each user gets an orthogonal channel, and that scheme can be applied to any TDMA, FDMA, CDMA, or FDMA scheme. 
And a slightly better scheme is to use the so-called lower triangular DPC code. And this is the code, OK? Again, random sparse on the left. Here is a lower triangular. And you have, you know, uh, yeah, basically lower triangular. And of course, you have identity on the diagonal. Uh, once on the diagonal, okay? So this scheme would require some causality because the second check may utilize the first check here. So it can only be applied to the TDMA system, okay? But this code is slightly better if you know from the coding theory, okay? This one has too many weight one columns and hence wouldn't perform very well. So here's the performance, okay? I have the black one, which is you know, uh, beneath the red one, okay, that's no cooperation. This red one overlaps the black one, it's the full repetition, meaning everybody forwards for everybody else. And the reason it's performing this bad is because, uh, you know, uh, what? Is the what is no cooperation basically means that, you know, each user just transmits once and no, no cooperation phase. Transmits to who? To a destination. I am, I'm having a thousand users and they take turns to transmit to a destination. And um, this is basically the average symbol error rate. So in, your, in your picture that you have, you have mm. some destination which has a certain channel, different channel to each user. Is that uh, The assumption here for simplicity, I'm assuming the homogeneous channels. So basically, all the sources. Okay, this signal to noise ratio here is basically the signal to noise ratio of source to destination, and each source has the same channel condition to a destination. So it's sti no, yeah, Rayleigh fading, statistically the same. Okay, not like instantaneously. Rayleigh, Rayleigh fading, block Rayleigh fading. Okay, okay, sorry, I forgot to mention. Okay, the assumption here is always block Rayleigh fading when I. No, I know. I'm just yeah. Okay. Okay, so what you're essentially saying, like all of them collaborating to sort of to induce some diversity. And, uh, That's right. I'm basically saying that I want to use the spatial diversity, and what is an effective way of doing it, right? Repetition is not very efficient. Space time calls, you know, require this, you know, uh, inter user cooperation at the symbol level, which is almost impossible. And plus, every time, you know, depending on how many, you know, um, relays are there, you have to find the right code m by one, right? And that is not always possible. You know, you have to somehow negotiate who transmits what, what code to use, and synchronize perfectly, okay? And I'm saying that, you know, we want to use network coding, which the idea is simple. The only tricky thing is that you want to be adaptive. So the adaptive is performed by, you know, using this graph matching idea, and it's kind of intuitive, I would say, right? Okay, so this is a performance gain. Okay, this is actually uh, a selective repetition, okay? Basically, each user repeats for only one other user, and this is actually not an ideal, well, this is an ideal case, assuming that they can arrange or negotiate in such a way, you know, everyone just uh, repeat for another person and nobody, re you know, somehow, uh, no, no target is repeated twice. Okay, it's just like a four round, yes? Is this a scheme from your picture? I mean these are the schemes. The blue lines are the schemes from my picture. And these are using LDGM codes with different degrees. Okay, by degree, I mean like how many. You actually call to design. I mean, uh, you mentioned that the schemes are adaptive and you mm -hmm. randomly Yeah, that's the only thing. We didn't even design how it. Do you get, how do you obtain, a, for example, a lower and a very Okay. You have a systematic. So this I, this LDGM part is very straightforward from from this graph. This is actually represents an LDGM code where you have an identity part. This part will be an identity if you know the coding graph thing. Okay. Now, if you want to get LDPC part, okay, the difference is this: with the LDGM case, you know, even only at the first phase, each user is listening and decoding and try to combine. Okay, and if that in the second phase, the user who has not had a chance to transmit keeps con uh, continues to listen, decode, and accumulate all symbols, and make them to be also an option for to perform the, to form this parity check code. Okay, to perform this uh, parity check symbol, and then it will go to a lower triangular LDPC code. Okay, now this is obvious, right? From this graph to LDGM code. Okay. So, so, like, if you have no cooperation, right? Mm -hmm. 
then it inter inter user channel doesn't matter, right? Right. But you get diversity order of only one, and this is block fading, right? And here you have some sort of symmetric channel between users. Uh, here I didn't have to assume anything. Basically, I don't even have to care for what is the you know uh, channel condition. Yeah, okay. You have some average, right? Uh, not really, but the, this thing is only, basically, if you really think about it. We don't do really increase. Now, the thing is that this is all, in fact, it's irrelevant, okay? Although I, I put it here, right? I said that 10% of inter-user connectivity between any pair of users. Okay. Although I put it here, right? But it doesn't have to be this, because if you really look here. So you do a CRC and whatever, okay. Well, okay, I, I didn't really do CRC. How would you implement it in practice? You would do a CRC, and if you if you decode it, then whatever you decode it, you do a, a combination. Of those. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you have to always rely on CRC to in order to make sure that you have decoded correctly. That's right. So, only can you pass this value by thinning? Say it again. Yeah. Oh, the sparsity is basically in order. See, listen here. Okay. Okay. So, for example, in the first phase, each user transmits, takes turns to transmit, right? And everyone listens and try to decode, okay? And assuming that user A hears all of them. So instead of performing a checksum on all of them, you can randomly select only a few of them. Okay, that is essentially a thing. For example, in this case, it selects only three. Okay, I mean, in reality, if we are talking about a large number of users, potentially you have too many candidates just randomly select a few of them okay and this factor we call it degree and that's also you know standard encoding so we have different degrees for example this is like everybody selects only seven okay packets and form a checksum and uh, here is everybody selects eight and so on and so forth okay that's all standard in channel coding so we have all these different classes of ldg um, codes you know different degrees we see that there's a small trade-off right between the waterfall region and the error floor okay but in general you know you select degree of eight or nine that should be good about 23 to 26 db gain now if we do lower triangular ldc code like i said you know you expect slightly better performance, 1 dB better, and lower error floor. Okay. What? Uh, I can talk to you out offline, because you know, I think you have to know something about the LDPC codes in order to <laughs> really appreciate this, because, uh, uh, well, I, I can talk to you later, okay. <clears throat> So this is ANC, uh, uh, some of the quick summary, okay? And of course, again, you can do the opportunistic relay, you know, which is user diversity and resource management, okay? So this is this. Uh, I did some of the analysis, okay? Uh, now this is a cooperative level, you know, mutual information. Um, and from mutual information, we can get capacity and outage, okay? And what I want to mention is that we can derive closed forms, but only for a symptotic case, meaning that we have infinite number of standards. Okay, for any finite cases, we have this integral there, and actually multiple integrals, which is not solvable. Uh, but anyway, we can also pl plot it numerically, so we have all these different curves. We have full repetition. Okay, different users. We have a partial repetition. Okay, we have a space-time coded cooperation, and we have this ANC. You know, different users. This is the number of transmitters, number of users, always a single destination. Okay, so this is what it is. Um, that's the capacity. Okay, I also have the outage computed. Okay, again, you know, the black ones are uh, the. Okay, uh, sorry. There is a full repetition which you cannot see. It's direct here. Okay, and, uh, and then there's also partial repetition. Okay, you have all over here. This is no cooperation, the green line. Okay, and oh, sorry. This is the full repetition. All these curves is the full repetition. Okay, this curve is the partial repetition. Okay, the full repetition, as you can see, as the number of users increases, you get a better and better diversity gain. But of course, because of the compensation, you know, called code rate penalty, you move further and further away from this capacity limit. Okay, and the blue and red lines are basically for space time code cooperation and ANC, you know, different number of users. Okay, um, you know, I think the details is. Uh, it's in the paper, okay. Um, but I, what I have, to, um, what I can say is that uh, um, ANC and space-time coded cooperation perform more or less the same, 
Okay, that's in theory. Okay, but please remember that the anchor is the more practical thing, and space-time code really is not practical. Plus, in computing all this space-time code, I always assume that no matter how many users overhear the packets, you always get an optimal m by one space-time code there available. Okay, and this all this is obtained by no additional cost. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll quickly go on to the next. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish in five minutes. Okay, um, so this is nice, but it's very. I simulated a large system, and as I started before, I want to talk about short systems because cooperating among a thousand users is really not that practical, especially if they are distributed around an area. So, what if the network size is small? Let's say five users. What happens? Okay. So the good news is that M can still be applied, and it's always going to be better than repetition and be more practical than space-time coded cooperation. Uh, the bad news, however, is that you, know, you see that again when you increase the block size, you, you increase the number of users. That's a rule by channel coding, OK? And the reason it's not performing as well for a short network is because the effective code length is small, OK? So the remedy here is, OK, resync ANC. ANC considers coding at a network layer, but how about coding at the physical layer? Remember, each packet may well have a channel coding in it. So the proposed strategy is basically joint channel network coding. Okay? And this should also be supported by the theory, because we know that you know, the, uh, the channel has this source channel separation theory for links. Right? And recent research results show that source channel separation may also hold for network. However, source network separation and channel network separation will break, meaning that routing cannot be performed in a separate way from source coding and channel coding. Or, or in other words, the previous assumption that source coding and channel coding are performed at the edges of the network, and then you sort it out, okay, that two-layer mechanism is not optimal. So in order to combine channel coding and network coding, okay, what we can do is that there's some layered strategy, okay, so each row is channel coded, then vertically we do network code, okay, that's one possible strategy. Okay, um, and then another possibility is basically, you know, each package channel coded, but you scramble it using a huge, huge interleaver and somehow coded using a single network code. Okay, that's another possibility. Uh, possibly very good performance, but high, huge complexity and not really practical because this huge interleaver has to be stored, okay? So what we propose is the so-called generalized adaptive network coded cooperation that treats channel coding as an integral part of network coding, okay? Um, the idea is actually very simple, okay? See, this is an LDPC code from ANC at a network layer. What happens is that when each relay repeating a parity symbol instead of basically adding what it has okay bit by bit in their original order what you do is that basically scramble each one using a different scramble interleaver and then combine them bit by bit in the new order okay this is the only difference between gank and ank you have this interleaving per package okay interleaving per package and furthermore, so this is basically scramble, okay? And if you look at this code, this code combines channel coding and network coding, and that essentially takes the form of circulant LDPC code, or the so-called quasi-cyclical. Well, no, at this point it's not, but if we are using the circul circulant interleaver, okay, that becomes a circulant LDPC code, okay? Yes? That's basically zero because you are not selecting these packets anyway. Sorry, I guess I didn't get an idea to you, right? Okay, um, but this is what happens. Okay, so this is user one, right? Transmit the packet. Oh my God, this is the five users, right? Transmit the systematic parts. Okay, then the first uh, relay. Okay, for example, it hears from user one, user four, user five, which it does is it basically perform a checksum and transmit it. Okay, so the second relay is going to hear while you are transmitting the systematic symbols as well as when the first relay is relaying. So assuming it also hears what this relay transmits, so it's basically going to pick this and perform a checksum. This is how actually you get to the lower triangular case. Get it? No. So I'm saying that you know, in the ANC, Basically, the packets are combined bit by bit 
in their original symbol. Now you want to scramble them. Okay, each packet using a different scrambler. Okay, and it turns out this does not even have to be a random scrambler. All you need is basically a circulant shift. In other words, you make it moving the first five bits, for example, to the very end. Okay, the next scrambler can be moving the first seven bits to the very end. So all you need is basically a circulant shift. Okay, and the good thing is that, uh, of course, you know, this basically essentially combines the packet length into the code. We now get a huge code. And previously, we might have length for cycles. Now, because of this interleaving or scrambling, okay, the length, of length for cycles will be broken. <coughs> so this is what I meant, like circulant interleaver. Okay, this is a matrix you're using. Okay, again, the overall LDPC code will become a circulant LDPC code. Okay, and all you need to store is one parameter. Okay, the position of the entry. Okay, you don't have to really store the entire interleaver, only an offset, a scalar here. Okay, or essentially, you can make it storage free if you make this circular shift, okay, the offset to be some function of the node IDs. Okay, so this is the performance gain. Okay, um, this basically shows that you know, random interleaving and circular interleaving perform the same. Okay, so this is when we are not interleaving. So this is essentially like ANC, the previous case, no interleaving. And this is basically GANC. You're combining channel coding with network coding. And we see that you know, no matter we are using uh, random or circular, they all perform the same. Okay, one is the frame error rate, the other is the bit error rate, uh, the symbol error rate. Okay, we see respectively 10 dB gain and 6 dB gain. Okay, this is talking about five users, and each user packet has 100,000 a a bits. Okay, or the size of each symbol, okay? So this will basically, okay, that's the general thing, okay? Um, the previous example here, actually, does, that example does not consider there's actually channel coding, okay? You know, this is a general graph where you, if you have channel coding, this is going to be the channel coding part. Each one has a parity check matrix, okay? And that's basically the combined channel coding and network coding part, which is what we just showed. Okay, and in terms of decoding, um, there were two ways, two possibilities of to decode it. Um, if the original channel codes are also sparse graph codes, such as LDPC codes, what you can do is that you can combine the whole thing as a huge LDPC code and perform this message passing algorithm on it. Okay, or if this is some type of a convolutional code or turbo codes, which is not decodable by message passing, you have to do somehow two-way decoding strategy, decode the Combine the channel network code and pass it to the you know each of the individual channel code and pass it back and so on and so forth. Okay, that's iterative decoding. Uh, and in general, joint decoding performs better. Okay, for example, this is the case where I showed that uh, uh, the red is the joint decoding of altogether 30 iterations. Okay, these are basically separate decoding, which I mean iterative decoding. Okay, of the joint channel network code and the individual channel code. So what we see is that you know eventually they can perform the same, but in order to for the separate decoding to perform the same as a joint decoding, you have to use a lot more iterations. Okay. <coughs> uh, so this is basically our concluding remarks. Uh, ANC provides an excellent performance by matching a code graph with network graph, and it's especially useful for large networks. Now for network size that's small, only a few users, what we propose to do is to integrate channel coding as a part of the network code. Okay? And the only trick we are using is circulantly interleaving it. Okay, basically shift it and combine it. It's very simple, practical, and effective. Okay, um, so some of the future work along the line. Um, right now, we consider multiple send senders and a single destination. So that's a multi-source data collection problem. What if we have a single des single sender but multiple destination? That will be a multi-source distribution data distribution problem. Okay, can we apply similar ideas? You know, graph matching. You know, uh, type of thing. Okay, and the second is from single hop to multiple hop. What do we do? Okay, you know, can we treat multiple hop as separate single hops? Okay, well, yes and no. The uh, the question basically is to decode or not to decode at each intermediate stage. Okay, you know, each has its advantage. Uh, so that's about it. Okay, you know, I'm not going to cover this. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, sorry for not making it entirely clear. Okay, <laughs> I see a lot of confusion in the audience. <laughs> you know, but yeah. yeah.
but they think they don't Is that a computing question or is that something for no talk or uh, This is just uh, throwing some ideas to think about it. This is not uh, basically. Okay, it's a start of something new or? Yeah, not really, just uh, something for, for fun and for discussion. You know, <laughs> because that's the hard part of network, right? I think in the recent uh, plenary talk in ISIT, you know, basically the, the, the challenge is that for point-to-point -point communication, things are well defined. We know exactly what is channel, what we know exactly what is the capacity. It's a well-defined problem. But for network communication, you know, there are too many dimensions, right? And even the mathematical model is not really well built, you know. There are so many different ways you can describe it, you know, graphs or maybe trellis, you know, or matrices, you know. A lot of this, you know, maybe they are not, well, I would say none of them are sufficient, you know, because there are so many diversities, right? Or so, so many dimensions of things, you know, time, you know, throughput, you know, not just like a signal to noise ratio versus the bit error rate, no longer so the simple. I'm I don't know the practicality of coding. Does it apply to wireless network coding? Say what it again. Say practicality of coding. Uh huh. I basically mean that you know the practically I mean two things. One is adaptive. Okay, so there's no centralized control. It does not require like a pre knowledge of entire network topology. And second, it's adaptive. Oh well, it is related. Okay, and second, it's distributed. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, adaptive and distributed, these two features make it practical. Okay, actually, we are implementing it in real net, in real wireless systems, okay, and depend on what level you're doing, you know, you can do it in the network layer, okay, not much network, in the Mac layer, or physical layer, okay, in the physical layer, that becomes cooperative physics, or in the Mac it will do to relevant radios, okay, apply on top of the radio, you know, just add in the Mac layer some of the buffers and some of the computing units and you can actually implement this. Okay. Yes? <laughs>